Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Throughout the history of Christianity, men and women claiming to represent Jesus have actually repelled unbelievers from the faith. How tragic. While this sad state of affairs can be attributed to a number of different kinds of failures, there has been any, has there been any greater barrier for the unbeliever than how the church and individual Christians have mishandled money matters. We're disgusted by the excesses that have dominated the headlines in our lifetime, but many like indiscretions dot the religious landscape since the time of Christ. That's why Jesus warns you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon, of course, is the God of wealth and riches. Early on, the church of the New Testament confronted religious sleaze. In Acts chapter 8, we find Simon the sorcerer seducing Samaria with magic or witchcraft. The gullible people considered Simon the great power of God. But according to verse 12 and 13, when Philip the evangelist came to town preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Simon knew the real deal when he saw it. He turned to God and turned his back on his sordid past, at least for a little while. Simon's penchant for money, power, and glory eventually got the best of him. The scriptures tell us in Acts 8, 18 through 24, and when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Simon tried to buy the gift of God, but the sacred is not for sale. We get the English word simony from the name of this biblical character who fell. Simony is the buying or selling of sacred Christian objects or offices. Simon turned from his sin and has long since gone on, but the sin of simony is alive and well. Far too often, those who bear the name Christian elevate money over the souls of men. One of the reasons that I'm a member of the Church of Christ is because the Church of Christ has zero tolerance for preachers who partner with mammon, the god of riches. This morning, we will contrast the attitude of the Church of Christ toward money with the prevailing spirit of the age. But first, enjoy our song.
The following words were from preachers quoted in the September 20th, 2004 edition of the Los Angeles Times. Can you guess what preachers uttered these words, whether it was Jesus, Peter, Paul, James, or John? Listen to this quote. If my heart really honestly desires a nice Cadillac, would there be something terribly wrong with me saying, Lord, it is the desire of my heart to have a nice car, and I'll use it for your glory. I think I could do that, and in time, as I walked in obedience with God, I believe I'd have it. Reckon Jesus, James, John, Peter, or Paul said that? No, it was Paul Crouch of TBN. Jesus, uh, James wrote, rather, in James 4, verse 3, You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may, listen, spend it on your pleasures, on your lusts. What about the following statement? Have you got something that you have been praying about 10, 15, 20 years? You have been praying for it and haven't gotten it. It could be that you haven't gotten it, this particular preacher says, because you are a tightwad and you haven't given your 10%. Was that Jesus or the Apostle Paul? No, Paul Crouch of TBN again. The Apostle Paul did write in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart. It's a personal decision between you and God how much you give. God is not some kind of a slot machine who wishes a jackpot to everyone who deposits a certain amount of money. Here's another quote. God spoke to me that there are a thousand people that will give no less than a hundred dollars. I got this word. Get up, get up, get up. Go to the phone. The Spirit of God promised me, this preacher says, that he would bless your seed. Go to the phone right now. If you're sowing $1,000, do it now. If you're sowing $100, do it now. No one in the Bible ever said anything like this, but Bishop McClendon did. How about this one? Quote, some of you are wrestling with debt that you cannot pay off. God told me this morning, he says, to tell you to sow a seed on the credit card that you want God to pay off. Get Jesus on that credit card, he says. Make a pledge on that credit card. Jesus, Paul, no. Pastor Rod Parsley. The Bible says there is a curse upon him who says God speaks to him when God has not spoken. You're on the brink of a miracle, another says. Go to the phone and give 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, and 1 million. Go to the phone. God has a miracle waiting on your response. Not Peter or Paul, but Rod Parsley again. The same LA Times article continues, quote, TBN viewers are told that if they don't reap a windfall, despite their donations, they must be doing something to block God's blessing, most likely not giving enough. The implication is that they're not giving enough to TBN. Crouch has particularly stern words for those who are not giving at all. He says, if you have been healed or saved or blessed through TB TBN and have not contributed, you are robbing God and will lose your reward in heaven. He said that during a 1997 telecast. One reason that I'm a member of the Church of Christ is because the Church of Christ does not preach the prosperity gospel. We're not in this for what we can get out of the world. The LA Times reports, quote, a central element of the prosperity gospel is that no one is too poor or too indebted to donate. Bishop Clarence McClendon, a preacher whose show aptly named, I think, Take It By Force, appears on TBN. He told viewers in March that God had asked him to deliver a message to those in financial difficulty. They should sow a seed by using their credit cards to make donations. In return, the Lord would see to it that the balances would be paid off within 30 days. This is an ugly practice. And this kind of talk has given faithful gospel preachers a black eye because people assume, well, they're all the same. They're just in it for the money. But that's just not the case. Let the Bible Speak has been on the air for over 40 years. And you have never heard Ronnie Wade, Irvin Barnes, Clovis Cook, Johnny Elmore, Reggie Kinzer, or any other preacher from the Church of Christ talk like that. In fact, you've never heard any of us ask for one penny. Sadly, the Times reports that TBN collects more than $120 million a year 
from viewers, many of which can't afford their medication. And what does it do? It funds salaries for Paul and Jan Crouch of over three quarters of a million dollars a year, not to mention the TBN jet and 30 homes that they have across the country, including a pair of Newport Beach mansions and a ranch in Texas, according to the LA Times. And they're still begging for money. Now, don't misunderstand. There's nothing wrong with being rich. Abraham, Joseph, David, and Solomon were wealthy. Having money is not a sin. But Paul does write in 1 Timothy 6.10 that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. After the church is established, the Holy Spirit does not tell the wealthy to sell all that they have, but instead says in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, the Bible says, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. The wealthy are urged to be generous and are warned against trusting in uncertain riches. Again, while there's nothing wrong with being well-to-do, God also says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 9 through 11, that those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So many preachers have given Christianity a bad name because their preaching promotes a desire to be rich, something the scriptures plainly condemn. One of the reasons that I'm a member of the Church of Christ is because its preachers do not beg for money at church, on the radio, or on television. It's a shame that men claiming to speak on Christ's behalf prostitute the gospel in the name of Christ. Instead of closing their program with talk about Jesus, the Word of God, or the church, now you've heard it, many close by begging for you to send them money. Is that really what God had in mind in preaching the gospel? The scriptures issue a resounding no. Paul writes by inspiration in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. The New King James Version reads, For we are not as so many, some translations say the majority, even back in that time, peddling the Word of God, but as of sincerity, as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. The Amplified renders 2 Corinthians 2, 17, for we are not like so many, like hucksters making a trade of peddling God's word, shortchanging and adulterating the divine message. The International Standard Version has, at least we are not commercializing God's word like so many others. Folks, isn't that exactly what's happening today? Preachers are corrupting and peddling the word of God for base gain. A plea for money, listen, is a red flag to help you recognize a false teacher. Think about it. Satan would not get very far if his servants, dressed up in a red suit with horns, pitchfork, and a pointed tail, spewing filth and hatred and then asking you to send them money. Instead, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Another scripture that exposes this base behavior is 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3. Listen to this. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. 
by covetousness. They will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. Again, isn't this what's going on in the religious world? Especially with many televangelists? The authorized version has for 2 Peter 2, verse 3, they will make merchandise of you. The Amplified reads, and in their covetousness, their lust, their greed, they will exploit you with false or cunning arguments. Green's literal translation suggests they will use you for gain. The New Living Translation, in their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. The New Century Version, those false teachers only want your money, so they will use you by telling you lies. Albert Barnes writes in his commentary, they treat you not as rational beings, but as a bale of goods or any other article of traffic. Let's face it, Christendom is filled with religious hucksters, peddlers, and swindlers. One wonders little how he that overthrew the tables of the money changers in the temple would respond to this kind of religious corruption. This is not just a problem, though, with individual televangelists and their ministries. Churches have certainly been guilty of making people feel like they care more about their money than they do about the people themselves and their souls. Remember John Tetzel, chief fundraiser for Pope Leo X by way of the Archbishop of Mainz in Germany? Tetzel, a traveling salesman peddling indulgences, told the common people, and everybody else for that matter, that they could purchase remission of the earthly consequences of sin. Tetzel actually made a chart with a price for each kind of sin. His spiel went, I have here the passports to lead the human soul to the celestial joys of paradise. The Holy Father, he was talking about the Pope, has the power in heaven and earth to forgive sins, and if he forgives it, God must do so also. Tetzel was also famous for the saying, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. No wonder the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. How did such a disgusting practice develop? Well, according to F.W. Maddox in his book, The Eternal Kingdom, after Prince Albert of Brandenburg paid Pope Leo X about $25,000 to buy the office of bishop, he then offered about $250,000 in modern equivalents to become the Archbishop of Mainz, and then about $250,000 more to buy a third church office. He didn't have the cash, so he borrowed the money from bankers. He received the loan from the bankers with the promise that he would pay it back with the sale of indulgences. And why did the Pope need to charge all this money to sell the office of Archbishop and so on and so forth? Well, it seems that he ran out of money in the big project of building St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Do you think all this is what Jesus had in mind? Is this what Jesus died for? The dark history of Tetzel, the Archbishop of Mainz, and indulgences is shocking. We haven't learned much from it, though, have we? These distasteful events point to where most of the financial coercion from churches originate. Churches get bogged down in so many building projects and endless expensive activities that they have to constantly pump and prime the congregation for more money. Watch your wallet. I've attended evening services, not Church of Christ services, where an offering bucket was passed not once, not twice, but three times. What is that all about? Before the bucket was passed the third time, a special prayer was offered to stimulate even more giving. Even as a visitor determined not to give a penny to support what I saw going on there, I felt the pressure that was intentionally exerted on the crowd. This is hard to square with what the New Testament teaches. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, so let each one of us 
Each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. The English Standard Version reads, Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. A.T. Robertson says the Greek behind the word compulsion means as if it were like pulling eye teeth. Far too often, that's what people get when they go to church. A little of the Bible contaminated with coercion to contribute more and more money. That's one more reason that I'm a member of the Church of Christ. The church is never coerced to give. I am a member of the Church of Christ because when it comes to giving, it's the same every week. One offering every Lord's Day. We feel like we cannot go wrong by doing it just like we read it in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. There the Bible says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Why can't people just settle for the simple New Testament worship that we read about in the Scriptures? No fundraisers, no hoopla, no pressure, no duns, no letters in the mail saying you're behind on your giving at church. Jesus taught in Matthew 6, 3 and 4 that our giving was between us and God. I'm a member of the Church of Christ because when it comes to giving, we stress the words of the Holy Spirit in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Are you a cheerful giver? Do you smile when you think about what you will contribute at church today? Or do you feel coerced and compelled? If you do, it doesn't matter how much you give because you won't be meeting the biblical standard. The problem may be your church and not your heart. One key to cheerful giving is knowing that the money you give is spent in areas authorized by Scripture. The church treasury is to be used for the spread of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 14, Romans 10, 15, the edification of the body, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, the care of needy saints, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and the support of certain qualified widows, 1 Timothy 5. When the Lord's money is spent only in biblical ways, it leads to cheerful giving. If you would like to get a copy of this message, stay with us and we'll tell you how you can do so right after our song. Once I was
i need to mention something we're not saying this morning that it's wrong to support financially those who preach paul writes in first corinthians nine do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Who goes to war at his own expense? A soldier doesn't pay his own way. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Do I say these things as a mere man, or does it not the law say the same also? Verse 14, even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Living from the gospel, though, is one thing, and what's going on in the religious world is far out of hand. Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. If you'd like a copy of the Bible and money, please write us, and we'll be glad to get it out to you. We also offer our free Bible study course that you can complete at home which this too is free of charge. We welcome your comments and questions. Please visit uh, letthebiblespeak.com where you can watch videos of the program at your convenience. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.